John's Gospel, chapter number 4. And I want to draw your attention a little past where we normally stop here in John to verses 39 through 42. John chapter 4, verses 39 through 42. And I want to share with you a message they believed. They believed. John chapter 4, again reading in verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him or, or pleaded with him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. That's John 4, verse number 40 now, 41. And many more believed because of his own word. So when Jesus had been there two days with them, preaching to the Samaritans, uh, John records many more believe because of the teaching and preaching of Jesus. Verse 42, And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, our churches all across America and even into the world. Uh, Lord, we need Sunday night services and we need you, God, to teach us your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you, through the power of your spirit, would do that work tonight. Lord, I realize that if there was a person here in this service that did not know Christ, Lord, without you, I'd have no ability to reach that heart and convince them of the truth that Jesus Christ saves sinful men. But Lord, you've given your Holy Spirit and the promise that comes with the giving of your Spirit that when he has come, he will convince the world, reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And God, I pray for Christ's sake that you would do that work, that you would draw those that may not know you to a real true relationship with you. But also, God, help us as your church, your body that's in this world, to realize the great uh, opportunity that we have before us. And Lord, help us to see that that you would have us to be busy about. But also, God, encourage us in that. Lord, sometimes Satan whispers in our ear, and sadly, Father, ashamedly, we have to confess that sometimes we believe his lies. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight the truth so that we would stand in the truth and that we might live according to your will. Help each of us, God, to leave this service more challenged, Lord, to do our part in getting others to believe in Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. John 4, like a lot of other chapters in your Bible, is just packed with great doctrines, truths that will transform your life. For instance, here we have a lesson about the humanity of Christ. And some people actually teach that Christ did not come in human form or in the flesh, a human body, but he was just a spirit or an ideal or a thought. But here in John 4, we see that Jesus is weary with his journey, amen, <laughs> physically tired. And we also see that he is thirsty as well, amen. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. <laughs> we also see the consequences of a sinful life. That's taught in this passage. There is no more shame for sin in our world today. It's promoted, it's encouraged. In fact, if you are exceedingly sinful, you can get a program on TV, amen? I mean, it is that promoted in our world. But this lady went to get her water, not in the morning when the other ladies would go, but she went at noontime, hoping to avoid everyone else. 
sin has consequences. Amen? Jesus gives a great lesson about how that we should love everybody. Amen? You say, where do you see that, preacher? Well, here Jesus is with the Samaritans. This woman is shocked that the Jew would even speak to her because there was such animosity between the Jews and Samaritans. And you don't see that coming from the lips of our Lord, do you? Jesus loved everybody. Amen? And we're taught in the Word of God that we're to love everybody as well. So there are just a multitude of lessons here uh, that you can glean from if you open up your Bible and look to learn a little bit more about the Lord Jesus Christ. But the great lesson and the one I want to draw your attention to here is the lesson of what causes men to believe. What causes people to respond to the gospel? And we see here in this passage there are three, and we'll point this out in just a little bit, three areas where men would listen and then they would believe. And they would believe the record that Jesus is indeed the Christ or the Messiah. You say, preacher, what does that include? Well, in the Old Testament there was the promise that God would send this anointed one, chosen one, Messiah or Christ into the world and that this Christ that God would send would save us from our sins and one day he would rule over the entire earth. And that's exactly what the Jews were anticipating when Jesus walked uh, in the earth, right? His disciples expected at any moment he would set his kingdom up. They wanted to rule, one on the right hand, on the left, remember? And so they believed in this Messiah. In fact, this woman embraced Christ for who he was. She believed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the sent one of God that would forgive her of her sins and grant to her eternal life. Well, we see where she put her faith and trust in Jesus and Verse 29, she said, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Listen, is not this the Christ? Amen? She believed that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. But in verse 39, we, we, get, to, we get to see where others now are going to believe this same truth. This woman runs into the town and she meets with the men and she tells the men about her experience with Christ. And verse 39 says these words, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of that woman. Now listen, that's easy for us. When we read it, we've heard it preached a multitude of times, right? She goes into the city, she tells the men, and the men believe. <laughs> but have you tried to stop and put yourself in the place of those men? I mean, we see the end result. We know what's going to happen, right? Because we read the story a million times. But imagine being in the city. You're one of those men. It's just another normal day, right? You've heard some rumors about this man that's of the Jerusalem. And he's a Jew, and there are mighty miracles that's going on in Jerusalem. You've heard reports that the dead are raised, that the blind receive their sight, that sickness, sick bodies are made whole, that demons are cast out, right? And uh, <clears throat> you've been hearing all these rumors, and all of a sudden, this woman that you know that doesn't have the best reputation bursts through the doors and she says, men, let me tell you what I have just experienced. I went down to get some water at the well and there was a man there. His name is Jesus and we got in a conversation. Wow, what a conversation. He asked me for some water and uh, I said, he was a Jew. I was shocked that he even spoke to me. And he said, if you knew who I was, I would give you water you would never thirst again. And, he, and I said, Lord, I want that water. And he said, well, go get your husband. And I just said uh, to him, Jesus, I don't have a husband. And he said, listen now, he said, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. 
Now, men, that has to be the Messiah. That has to be the Christ. I, he didn't know that. He's a complete stranger to me. Nobody knew that information. How did he know it? He could only know it if he was the Messiah, the true sent one of God. Amen? And when she gave that report or that testimony, those men that heard her testimony believed in Jesus just as she did. And you say, preacher, what's the point to that? Well, the point to that is, a lot of times we wait to tell others about Jesus until we kind of get our lives a little bit more straightened up. Is that true or not? I mean, we feel a little bit guilty talking about Jesus to others when our lives are in such a mess. And can I say something to you? That is one of Satan's favorite tricks. Just to get you to delay being obedient to God. You know why? Because the longer you go without mentioning Jesus to anybody, the longer it will be before you ever bring up Jesus. Amen? Now, I, I'm, I try to be honest with you. I don't try to tell stories and fibs. So I just... I'm. I failed as a Christian. I've messed up many times. I've tried to learn from my failures. When I first started working, I wanted just to go to work, be a good, hard-working man, be an honest man. I didn't want to use profanity. I wanted to live in a good, moral way. At lunchtime, I would bow my head and pray, but I didn't talk to men about Jesus. I didn't invite them to church. I thought, well, I'll just try to live a good moral life and show them I'm the real deal. And uh, when maybe later on, I'll bring up the subject of Jesus to them. But you know what? I fell into a trap. And uh, Satan is good at trying to set those kind of traps for us because what I would start thinking about is I need to tell these men about Jesus. And then, Brother Lewis, I just heard their response. You mean to tell me you've been coming to work here for three months, six months, or longer, and you're a Christian, and you haven't said anything to me about Jesus at all? And I would get embarrassed that I hadn't mentioned Jesus to them, and you know what? I would put off even longer mentioning. Have you ever fallen into that kind of trap? I have. Well, so when I changed jobs, I purposed in my heart, that I would be a better witness on this job than I was on my previous job. And every time I change jobs, and thank the Lord it hadn't been too often, I've always tried to improve my testimony and my witness, and I've come to realize something. The, the, the first time you meet, you meet someone, if you'll go ahead and mention church or Jesus or something along those lines, you've already broken the ice, and it'll always be easy for you to bring the subject up. But the longer you wait to mention Jesus, the harder it's going to get to mention Jesus. Amen? This woman, I mean, she has lived a difficult life, right? Is that true? Married five times, living with someone now who wasn't her husband, but yet God used her to go in and tell the other men some good news and they responded to her testimony and trusted in the Messiah as well. Amen. I just want to encourage you, don't wait until you think I've got everything lined up before you start mentioning Jesus to others because many will believe your report today. Amen? I mean, there's some people right now, if you were to bring up Christ to them, they would respond to your witness. I'm not saying to you everybody's going to be saved, but I'm saying to you there are some people you could reach if you would just speak up and say, let me tell you what this man told me. Isn't that good news? Amen. Well, not everybody gets saved that way. Amen? When Jesus came into the city, they besought him, they begged him, would you please stay with us a few days? And we find out in verse 41, and many more believe because of his own words. Isn't that good? I'm saying to you, if you've been saved today, 
you can help somebody else get saved. Amen? Amen? That's true. That's what this woman's testimony reveals. She hadn't been saved an hour. And she's already bringing other people to Jesus. By the way, you see, that's a pattern in the Bible. It's not get saved and wait 20 years to start being a witness and passing out tracts. It's trust Christ and immediately go to your family and others and start trying get, to get them to trust Christ as well. Amen? But there were some who wouldn't receive her testimony. Can I say something to you? Sometimes people won't receive your testimony either. You're not going to win everybody you talk to. By the way, even this little text, Jesus is preaching, Jesus spends two days with them, and it does not say, and they all believe. It doesn't say that, does it? It said many more believe. It didn't say all. Sometimes we get real discouraged because we talk to people, and we talk to people, and we talk to people, and the people we talk to, not all of them are getting saved. And sometimes not many of them are getting saved, right? But I promise you, God will use you to save some, right? So Jesus is now preaching to these individuals. He speaks, and he finds, he finds hearts that have fertile soil. These men are ready. They want to respond. And Jesus finds some who are willing to consider his words and to embrace that truth. Now listen, you would say, Preacher, if, if Jesus came and talked to me one-on-one, -on -one, I think I'd get saved too. Amen? Amen. <laughs> right? But again, not everybody Jesus talked to got saved. Amen. I mean, most people think the Apostle Paul was probably one of the greatest Christians we've ever seen. Right? Would mo most of y'all agree with that? And when Paul first started going out preaching... The first place he went to, there's no record that anybody got saved. <laughs> the next place he went to, it sounded like maybe one person got saved. And it wasn't long after that, and he was getting stoned and put in prison. I mean, it wasn't just, he opened up a tent, and it filled up with folks, and everybody, and the altars were all full every night as hundreds of thousands of people were being saved. That's not, that, that's not the way the book of Acts reads, does it? No. So even they rejected the words of our Lord. That's sad, isn't it? But I want to remind you of some great truth. I want you to listen to this. You and I are the body of Christ. You know, when you talk to somebody, it's just as, as though that Christ himself is talking to that person. Now, I know for some of you, that's kind of like a preacher. You're, <laughs> that's stretching it. <laughs> I mean, I want to be like Jesus. <laughs> but I find myself not nearly like Christ. I want to be like Him, but I, I don't represent Jesus like I want to represent Jesus. But let me just remind you that if you're a Christian, you are part of the body of... Isn't that true? Now, sometimes we're just going to have to make up our minds just to stand on what He said in His Word, right? You know, we look at ourselves, we'll always be discouraged, we always will be timid, we'll always see weakness, but if we realize that we are hid in Christ, and that Christ has sent us out, and that He is speaking through us, it is just as though Jesus was speaking to them one on one. And that's what He's called us to do, Amen. I don't win anybody to Christ. Christ is the one that wins them. Amen? And all he needs for you is for you to commit to be a, a spokesman for him. Amen? Just so that you could, he could use your, your vocal cords and your mouth and your lips. Amen? Just to tell them the good news. And if you will let God use you, you will see many more will believe. Amen? I like what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 20. And Brother Casimir even mentioned this this morning, if you recall that word ambassador. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. 
Isn't that a powerful statement? We pray you, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, listen, God is using Christians and we are standing in for Jesus. We're taking His place. Our King is sitting up on the throne in heaven but we are in His stead. We are taking His place. We're standing in His shoes and we're telling you the same thing He would tell you if He was standing before you eyeball to eyeball. Amen? Now see, these men were convinced because they heard the words of Jesus. Can I say something to you? God will also use you to convince people because they'll hear the same words of Jesus through your lips. Isn't that good news? You are part of the body of Christ. Isn't it interesting if you went to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we usually don't back up when we read verses. You know, we go verse 20, then verse 21, but... Go back up to verse 19 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number, verse, uh, 5, verse 19. Listen to what Paul says in the verse previous to verse 20. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Remember in verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. You see what Paul is saying? Paul is saying when Christ was here, he was speaking for the Father and now you are speaking for me isn't that what he's trying to get across even in this statement it is a statement of humility because we know Christ is God robed in the flesh he's not just a mere man amen he is the God man he's the eternal son right and so you and I have the same role that Jesus had. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, who can finish that other, the rest of that verse up? So send I you. Amen? Amen? You say, preacher, I would love for folks to hear from Jesus. Well, go out there and let God use you and they will hear from Jesus. As you stand for Him. And listen, I know... That takes faith, amen? amen? Lord, I can't win anybody, so just speak through me. <laughs> Tell them what you would want them to hear. Listen to Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Luke 10, verse 16. He that heareth you, heareth me. Amen. Isn't that good? No, I'm not saying you're a little God. I'm not saying you're the Son of God in the sense of being the only begotten Son of God. But I'm saying to you, Jesus told us these words. If you want the lost, these men that had to hear it for two days, and by the way, thank God Jesus was willing to stay that long. Amen? Amen. Some you'll win the first time you talk to them. Some it'll take a little bit longer. Amen? But if you let God use you, I'll assure you, you will see people coming to Christ because that is God's will that men come to Christ and that they would be saved. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Amen? So they heard from Jesus. But notice there's another part of this message I didn't read for you. It's found a little bit earlier. The disciples had gone in, John chapter 4 again, they'd gone into town, they went to get some food for their Lord, and they come back, they see the woman leaving. They're shocked that Jesus is speaking to her. And they come to Jesus, and in verse 31, they said, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. Here's some food. We've bought some food. Here, Master, here's something to eat. But Jesus responded. He said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Now listen to where their mind went. And this is one of our biggest problems. Because we think just like these disciples are thinking. We think mainly on worldly, temporal terms all the time. Christ was always thinking about eternal things. Right? He was always mindful of the will of the Father. He had souls on His heart. Amen? 
They come and say, Lord, here's something to eat. He said, listen, guys, I have some food that you don't know anything about. And, th- and listen to their response in verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Now, it, it's a little silly, but I'm afraid we do the same thing a lot of times, don't we? <laughs> and, and many times when you read what Jesus said to them and their response, you chuckle a little bit because you have the whole picture there. <laughs> but we do the same thing with Christ over and over again, don't we? He is mindful of a great harvest, a great need. There's a great burden. And all they can think about is what in, what's in front of them whether he's going to eat something for his physical body or not. I wish I could help all of us here, because it's sad. You know why America's going down, down, down spiritually? Because we are infatuated with money and things and positions and titles and and what we can get out of this world that one day is going to melt with a fervent heat. We're worried about if, we, if we're going to have this or if we're going to get that. And it's all about the temporal, the here and the now. And there's an eternity standing right in front of us and we're blinded to it. Jesus, verse 34, saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Guys, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about what I'm called to do, what I'm called to do, God's will for my life. And can I just plead with all of us tonight and remind all of us, listen, God has a will for your life as well, and it's in harmony with the will of Christ here. It's that we share the good news with people. And by the way, listen to me, it's not just people across the oceans that have never heard the gospel you would be shocked at the people who live in the United States of America and who know absolutely nothing about the fact that Jesus came to this earth, born of a virgin, suffered, lived a sinless life, suffered, bled, and died on a cross, and was resurrected, and only through Him and by Him can we have everlasting life. When I worked at Chifty Marble, one day I went in and talked to the men that I worked with, and I asked them a simple question. I said... I said, what is the gospel? And one of the guys said, well, the gospel is the uh, first four books of the New Testament. I said, no, they contain the gospels, but that's not the gospel. Another one said, well, that's, the, uh, that's that uh, religious music people sing, right? <laughs> that's the religious music people sing. Now, now listen to me. Some of these folks attend church somewhat. Maybe not as regular as they should. Uh, most of them weren't just, you know, really just vile and vulgar. But mo- most everyone I talked to, no one could say the gospel is that Christ was uh, born a virgin, <laughs> lived a sinless life, died and rose again, and if you trust Him, no one had that answer. And you and I all the time think that our neighbor... Surely he knows that only Jesus can keep him out of hell. Well, can I say something shocking to you? Most likely he has no clue. Amen. And there's a lot of people going to church who think because they're sitting in a church pew one day they're going to sit in heaven. And you don't get to heaven by going to church. You get to heaven by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen? I'm saying to all of us there's a great work that's before us as well. Jesus went on to say to his disciples, Say not, say not ye, verse 35, There are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. you probably heard this before, but when he says they're white already to harvest, that means they're not just ripe, they are over ripened. If you don't get out there now, it's all going to be lost. You only have a brief time. It's right. No, it's not just right. It's overripening. You've got to get out there quickly or you'll lose the whole harvest. Now, how many of you ever picked corn? 
You ever pick corn? You go out there and they test it, you know. <laughs> and you got to pick it at a certain time, right? My father-in-law, he wanted to pick it so, so he could feed animals. So if it had any juice in it at all, it was you couldn't pick it then because it would just mold and rot and you had to wait till it dried up completely. And you'd go out there today and test it, a little bit of juice, and it'd be not just long at all. If the weather was right, it'd quicken up, and, it, and if you wanted to use it for eating yourself, it was too late. He's saying, guys, you don't have but a short, brief period of time. Some of these men would die within a few years. It wasn't long until James had his head cut off. Right? They didn't have a, a long time to do what they were going to do for Christ. And by the way, not, not one of us knows when God has set our number, the number of our days is up, right? We don't know. In his sovereignty, he may not let you see your 21st birthday. A lot of people died before they got to 21. Amen. And you say, preacher, I'll really get serious about serving God once I settle down, get married, and start having children. My, let me say something to you. By then, it's already too late. Right? By the way, you may not ever make it to then. One of the saddest things I've ever dealt with here in Jacksonville was a lady who was so bitter, so bitter. I wish she understood. I tried to get her to understand. They were having their first, they were, she was married. They were having their first baby boy. The dad was on the way to the hospital to see his newborn son, first son. And he got in a car accident and before he made it to the hospital, he died. You just never know when your last day on earth has come. Amen? Amen? You can't just keep thinking, well, i got all the time in the world to pass out a tract. You better get busy now passing out some tracts and talking to your parents and your loved ones that don't know Jesus and your children and give them another invitation to come to church and your neighbors and try to help somebody because in helping somebody, you'll reach some for Christ. You know, since this time, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, I don't know, let's say that lady, when she went to town, the woman by the well, the Samaritan, maybe she led ten or so men to Christ. I think that would be a generous number. The men hurt her. Thirty men. Jesus spends two days. Let's say he won three hundred. The gospel has been preached for nearly two thousand years. <laughs> Millions of people have come in to the family of God. Amen? More and more and more, Jesus goes on and says to these men, and he that reapeth receiveth wages, that is, he that goes out there and harvests the field, the grain, the watermelons, or whatever, he receives a wage for his work, fruit unto life eternal. Then he says, that both he that soweth, the one that planted the seed, and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And I'm telling you, just want to say something tonight. We're closing. You're doing one or the other. Either you're planting the seed in someone's heart who's never heard the gospel, amen, or you're cultivating that seed, and one day maybe God will use you to help bring that person completely to Christ. Isn't that good news? God wants to use you. That's how men believe, by the way. They believe by hearing the message of salvation. These men believed because a woman testified and said, He told me all things ever I did. And they said, Wow, that has to be the Messiah. Two days Jesus spent with these men in this town. And they said, Yes, I believe what he said. He has to be the Messiah. But can I say something to you? Men have got up Men have passed out tracts, men and women. They've, they've worked on mission fields. they preached simple sermons like this. And for years and years and years, people have been getting saved. Amen? The uh, first time I went out on visitation with my pastor, I was ruined, completely ruined. We went up there, knocked on the gentleman's door. He came to the door. He said, well, preacher, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming by today. Come on in. It's not normally the response you get, by the way. We went in and sat down, and the TV was on. He said, excuse me, Pastor, let me turn the TV off. Another 
response that you normally don't get. My pastor said, well, Greg, I told you that you come to church Sunday and just want to ask you a question. Are you, are you contemplating spiritual things? Are you considering the things of God? He said, preacher, I sure am. He said, would you mind if I take the Bible and show you in the Bible how that you can be saved? He said, preacher, I, would love, I, need to, I, I want to see that. Went through the Romans road. He agreed with everything that God knelt in the couch. Trusted Christ as his Savior. Came to church the next Sunday. Made the open profession of faith and was baptized. And I thought to my preacher, I said, if it's that easy, why isn't everybody doing that? And he knew what I was thinking. When I, I was going out of the car, I was thinking to myself, that is so simple. <laughs> that is easy. So He likes to kind of bring me down sometimes. He said, Tommy, I want to tell you something right now. It usually don't go that way. <laughs> and by experience, I can tell you, it usually don't go that way. But sometimes it does. <laughs> I missed uh, my friend, Ahadi. Uh, he was from the Congo. And a pastor friend of mine had stopped in at McDonald's eating and he was in there sweeping the floor. And I said, hey, what's your name? He said, Ahadi. I said, what? <laughs> what? He said, Ahadi. I said, Ahadi, do you go to church anywhere? And he said, I have no man. I have no man. I said, well, if you need a ride to church, buddy, I'll be glad to take you to church. He said, would you? I said, yes. He gave me his address. I started, and those folks that know, when he first started coming, know this to be true. Every Sunday I went by and picked him up. He was wet, ready and waiting. Had a Catholic background. One Sunday after I preached the gospel, I said, and we were talking. He said, I said, and I said, preacher, I need to accept Christ. And in this room, where we all get coffee sometimes now, we sat at a little table, and in there he bowed his head and trusted Christ as his Savior. And let me tell you something, too. His life changed. He started inviting folks to come to church. He started saying, Preacher, what does this verse say? What does that Bible verse mean? Where can I read about this? Hey, I heard this. Does the Bible say anything about that? I mean, he was hungry for the Word of God. And listen, that was one, what you might say, chance encounter at a McDonald's. Yes, ma'am. Thank God for that. Later on, he would work at Walmart, and he worked with Sister Wilhelmina and said, "Won't you come to church?" And Sister Wilhelmina came to church, and Brother John, and and, and Amika, Amika comes uh, because of a hottie's invitation as well. Amen. And that might be you. <laughs> and God wants to use you, and God will use you. Amen. Let Him use you. Let's stand for prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Lord, as we think about mission.